I've seen a situation where it was written in, they pay for college. Then the daughter made some poor decisions, eventually got herself together four or five years later. And then was like, Hey, I want to go to college now. And the dad's like, you squandered that. Yeah. You're 30, <laughs> you're 32 yeah. now. So <laughs> she, she sued him and she won mm-hmm. and she, she had to pay for college. Welcome to the Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Joining me today is Missy Beach, the world's best financial advisor, and Leslie O'Neill, a family law attorney, here to talk to us about alimony and child support and all the things that men love to talk about. Or women, (laughs) of course, of course. Casey. That was sarcasm, Missy. Let's rein you in. (laughs) We're going to start the fight right now. Glad, Leslie. Favorite topic. (laughs) Yes. Leslie, this is your first time on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you guys for having me. Let's uh, let you introduce yourself and your firm. All right. Well, good afternoon, listeners. I'm Leslie O'Neill. I am a partner with Odell O'Neill, Hungerford & Blanchard. I've been practicing family law for 16 years. Um, we do all kinds of different areas of the law, but that that's my primary focus is family law, which includes the issues of alimony and child support. So I've been haggling with those issues for quite some time now. So hopefully I can share some in, uh, information that's um, helpful to your listeners. We'll start with a good story. Do we have any good stories? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure I get, it's so I feel clean like, and easy I feel every like case, right, mar- Leslie? I feel like um, marital law is like the wild, wild west of law. And then at the same time, you guys have to like rein in all these emotions with the people that you're working with. Yes. Oh, people, there's a lot of bad behavior in family law. I've, I've heard judges say that criminals and in their courtroom are bad people at their best and family law <laughs> litigants in their courtroom are good people at their worst. And that's yeah. I hate to say it, you know, people tend to, um, you know, get a little paranoid, get a little uneasy when they're going through a divorce. And that's kind of natural. You're litigating. It's really the only time you're litigating against someone that you once swore to to love and honor and cherish so it's it's an emotional area for 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 folks um so a funny story i guess was an alimony story um it was a a pretty nasty divorce and the husband um went on a a trip with his new girlfriend uh, right after the divorce and mailed his alimony check um from the champs elysees in paris (laughs) Um, with a postcard (laughs) and had his girlfriend sign the postcard. So yeah. Wow. Right. A little salt. Oh, salt in the wound. But did the check 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 cleared. So right. You know, (laughs) (laughs) the important guys got to focus on what's important. That's right. The check arrived on time (laughs) per the divorce decree. That's what I would have said. Exactly. Did the check check clear? Yeah. (laughs) I guess, Leslie, one thing that everybody wants to know is you know what's the general rule of thumb and okay. i try to tell people like i don't really think there is one that's a that's actually a surprisingly accurate answer um oh. i will start with alimony um, okay. because that's just we call it the wild wild west yeah. when it comes to alimony um I will say it's sort of a dying concept um, a little bit because you've got more and more, it it was traditionally awarded to women, not always, not required to be awarded to women, but traditionally, when you have traditional families that you think of from 30, 40 years ago, the men would go out and work and the the women would stay home and and rear the children and, and forego any sort of career opportunities for that. So... That was traditionally who was receiving alimony, um, women that that stayed home and and reared the children. Nowadays, there are just a lot more women in the workforce, and there are a lot more opportunities for women in the workforce, and there are a lot more female judges that are working and not receiving a payment from anyone else (laughs) other than their employer. So um, I would say it's become, you know, I started practicing law 16 years ago, and it was a lot easier to get alimony. It was a lot more discussed topic back then. now, so it's it's more of a buzzword. Men men bristle at the concept mm-hmm. of alimony, and um, and I think women are starting to realize a little bit more and more that you know when they go see a good seasoned lawyer, they're going to hear that it's not not quite as easy as it used to be to get alimony. And not only that, often it, particularly if you're still you know at an age where you can work, you're sort of expected to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, it's very dependent on your judge. Also, um, it's it's decided by someone who's just a a person that puts their pants on every day like we do and and they can consider 
quite literally any relevant factor. That's how broad it, it can be. Any relevant wow. factor, conduct, length of the marriage, financial resources of the parties, the health of the parties, the separate property of the parties. Mm-hmm. If one party has you know, $5 million in inheritance sitting over here in a bank account that's not going to be divided because it's that their separate property, that could play a role in whether someone needs alimony. The standard of living, you hear a lot of, about that um, in the community. So there's a lot of different factors, but you're absolutely right when you tell your clients it, it's, it's, it runs the gamut. It's hard to really nail down exactly what an alimony number would be. It boils down to Does the payor have the ability to pay it? Mm -hmm. And does the receiver need it? So that's the, if if you gave a simple, simple answer, it's based on need and ability to pay. Wow. So the more resources you've had, it sounds like the more clear cut it is. It's really easy to argue about alimony when you've got a lot of money to to work with. Um, I will say there's a lot of upper middle class families that, don't just have a ton of disposable income. They live a really nice lifestyle, but they send kids to private school and they have nice cars and they want to go on nice vacations and they have a little bit of savings and a little bit of retirement. But when you take that and you separate households and now you're taking those same paychecks or paycheck and uh, sustaining two separate households and paying lawyers and all all of a sudden there's not a whole lot of money to go around. And, um, And that's when it gets a lot harder to negotiate alimony when there's just... Those those realities. When you've got somebody that makes, you know, uh, you know, is is the CEO at Coke, they're going to pay a lot of alimony because it's a drop in the bucket, mm-hmm. you know. And those are kind of the, frankly, the easier cases to negotiate. Yeah, so I was thinking. So what's the difference between that and child support? So child support, I mean, naturally, child support is is for the benefit of the child. I would say it is a lot easier to calculate child support because we do have a calculator and a formula mm-hmm. for child support. Um, you're going to put in, and it, uh, what with everything, it's that's the easy part. But there, there can be complications. First, you're going to put in the the father and mother's gross monthly income. That's really easy when you have a, a postal worker and a teacher because they get W twos, and mm. you can figure out their income relatively easy easily. Um, when people are self employed or they work on commission or they have a bonus that might come, might not come. That's when it becomes a little hairier. There's a little more to to unpack there. Um, But we start with that. What are the parents' gross monthly incomes? Then we determine who's paying health insurance for the child. That number goes um, into the calculation. For smaller kids, we have work-related child care. That can be very costly depending on the age Mm -hmm. of the children. So that can go into the child support worksheet. Other um, exceptional expenses, such as private school costs, Things of particularly expensive extracurricular activities, those can also be factored into the child support calculation. Parenting time can be factored in. So if a lot of times these days folks are doing 50-50 custody arrangements, not always, but that's also becoming more common because you've got two working parents that need the help and can't really do the traditional um, visitation schedule that we used to see um, decades ago. So, um, So because of that, a lot of times the person that has more income is thinking, well, why would I pay the full child support amount if I've got the children 50% of the time? So a parenting time deviation is also something that can can factor in. So what should be simple, the idea is we're going to just have this calculator and it's going to make it really, really simple. But there are a lot of other factors that can um, complicate things. But they're at least with respect to child support, there's a formula. And it's also based on the number of children and so forth, whereas alimony is, is a little more and big. child support is only until age 18. Is that correct? It's a, until age 18 or when the child graduates from high school, whichever occurs later. later. So a lot of time, but if the child is still in high school, by the time they reach age 20, it terminates at that point. Okay. That's usually special needs children or a child that was, was held back a grade or two that are, you know, goes beyond the age of 18. Usually it extends until they actually graduate from high school. So Leslie, do you have any advice for post high school education? Because I know, you know, those kids are no longer minors and every parent is well intentioned and saying, oh yeah, I'll provide for his Mm -hmm. or her care throughout college. But I feel like that's always a point of conflict in a lot of these debates or discussions or working out agreements because Mm -hmm. No one wants anything in writing right. once the child is over 18. It's, so it is a bit of a sticky wicket. That? Yeah. I I tend to to caution folks not to put anything in writing also. Mm-hmm. Number one, the judge can't do it. A court loses jurisdiction over a child when they become an adult. So as soon as they turn 18, 
and graduate from high school, the court loses jurisdiction. So there is not going to be a court, a, a judge mm-hmm. in the state of Georgia that's going to order anybody to pay for college at all. It's not going to happen. However, um, parties can agree and negotiate amongst themselves to be bound by an agreement on, with respect to college. And that often, ha- we see that in a lot of settlement agreements for whatever reason. Hey, I'll give you the tax dependency exemptions if you'll agree to be bound for college. I know you can't get that from the judge, but you're also not going to get the tax dependency exemptions. So let's play, you know, mm-hmm. let's make a deal here and and get that. And so we, we see that a lot. And, and a lot of times people want to pay for their kids' college, and they are in the, embroiled in some nasty divorce, and it's important to the other side that that be included in the agreement. So it gets included because they're like, you know what, I was going to do that anyway. So we actually do see it a lot, a, a college clause. Mm-hmm. Once it's in there, the court can enforce it. So oh, that's, they, can. they can enforce okay. it. At that point, it's a con- they're, the parties have contracted with one another. The court's adopted that agreement, so the court can enforce it by way of a contempt if they need to. I've just seen a lot of horror stories with these. Mm -hmm. Um, First, you don't know what your financial circumstances are going to be 10 years from now. What if the other person makes four times as much as you and you've bound yourself to 50% of college expenses? What if you and your child are at odds with one another and they, you know, aren't doing the right things and getting the right grades and you're, you don't have the capacity to be like, you know what, you're coming home and going to this school or going to community college for a semester to shape up. You know, you, it almost deflates your ability Uh to be a parent to some degree as well. But primarily the changes in financial circumstances, um, that that's a a big one. You just don't know where you're going to be. You can always agree to do it down the road amongst yourselves voluntarily. But because a court can't do it anyway, I I caution people about agreeing to be bound. I, I try to talk about let's figure out a way to set up a 529 and maybe do some mandatory distributions into that instead. Um, So maybe if there's some resource or even a bank account, we were going to divide this bank account. You know what? Let's go ahead and Mm -hmm. earmark that for college now um, rather than divide it between the two of you. That's that'll be an advance towards some college expenses. So that's another way to skin the cat. I've seen a situation where it was written in they pay for college. Then the daughter made some poor decisions, eventually got herself together four or five years later. And then it was like, hey, I want to go to college now. And the dad's like, you squandered that. Yeah, you're 30, <laughs> you're 32 yeah. now. So <laughs> she, she sued him and she won mm-hmm. and she, she had to pay for college. I, I saw a very similar situation. <laughs> where that was in, I think that was in Floyd County, actually. Mm-hmm. I, had, I had one in Cobb <laughs> County where the child got involved and sued one of the parents. I mean, yeah. so it can really go sideways if you're not careful mm-hmm. and you just don't know what the future holds. So that's a really good point. And I have used that technique that you just mentioned, some random joint account Mm -hmm. that they're just going to split down the middle, Mm -hmm. say, hey, let's carve this off for college and Mm -hmm. just let it percolate. So is there there a situation where you'd want to do all this in one county versus another county? Yeah, I mean, there are different, Mm -hmm. every case is- I mean, you have to do it in a county that you're living in. Correct. One of you is living in. Yes, generally you file a a divorce action in the county where the defendant resides. There are times when people live in two different counties um, and you kind of try to jockey for, I'm going to wait and let them file because I'd rather litigate in my county versus theirs. There are certain counties, I would say, that are more known for being financially generous to the wife um, or more, um, you know, stingy with money when it comes to alimony and those types of things. So yeah, I would definitely say that the county matters. It's really the judges that matter. I would say the more remote you, this is a very general rule broad, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but the more remote you get, the more likely you're to find more traditional kind of old Mm -hmm. school judges, Mm -hmm. the closer to the city you get, the more, you know, liberal ideas you're going to have. Um, so that that's kind of how we approach jurisdiction, but we're, our hands are mostly tied, not always, but most of the time they are. So Leslie, what are your thoughts on who files first? Because sometimes parties are hesitant Mm -hmm. to file. They think, oh, maybe, you know, he was wrong, she was wrong, so he should file first or she should. I think people feel too strongly about that issue Mm -hmm. and place too much significance on it. I tell people that a lot. Um, I, I, I... does it matter? And there's a small, I would say, negligible advantage to being the plaintiff. Oh. And and the only mm-hmm. reason, I, I don't want to overstate it because it's, it's really negligible, but the only reason is you just get to go first. You get to okay. argue first. The court hears from you first. If you're ever in court, um, I, you put up your case first. A lot of times judges kind of start making up their minds early on. Mm-hmm. And it's once they start to think through this, you know, these through these ideas that it's hard to change their minds later on. So... 
if I had my choice, mm-hmm. I would say I'd, I would rather be the plaintiff, but I would never advise people to just rush to the courthouse to beat the other person to file. Don't the other, if you, if the other side ends up paying the filing fee, there you go. You just save 300 bucks. So <laughs> uh, I don't think it's such a, and most cases frankly don't end up in court. Yeah. So that's, that's why I say it's a pretty negligible advantage. Yeah. One of the questions we had um, going into this was talking about, can alimony be modified? Um, I would add to that question, uh, child support, because mm-hmm. I see situations where clients are divorced. It's supposed to be 50, 50 custody, mm-hmm. but yet 75% of the time the kids are with mom, mm-hmm. but yet why do we get 50, 50? Why was that negotiated? And I assume it's negotiated because they don't have to pay alimony if, if, if the, inc- or the uh, child support, because the income was very similar, mm-hmm. but so it's 50, 50, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. no one has to pay anybody. Right. But in the end, if the kids were with mom 75% of the time, shouldn't mom be getting something yes. for that? Yes. Yes. But absolutely. then, but then to go back, I it's have, multi- I have, I have multiple points here, yeah. <laughs> but then mm-hmm. to go back and reopen that case is on a, what cost you $20,000 probably. Oh gosh, that depends. I mean, I, uh, it depends I think on the situation. it depends on the situation, the other lawyer in the case, who the judge is, how, how simple the finances are. Right. You know, if every, like I, my example earlier, if everybody's a W2 wage earner, it makes it a lot easier to negotiate, to figure out the child support number. Right. Um, but I'm saying after the fact, to, After the fact, modifications are big cases so, and are so frequently negotiate done. well the first time. I agree. It? I agree. Yeah. We negotiate well the first mm-hmm. time, but I will say a lot of people come back to modify. Um, and both it, I, it's a, it's a different approach for child support versus alimony. Um, child support. I often, I often discourage people from modifying child support because you'd be surprised as people come in and say, well, so-and-so has a, um, a new job and they're making a lot more money. That's usually the reason is the other person's making more money because people tend to make more money. Um, every now and then somebody lost their job, but it what the dirty reality is it, that once they get a new job, they're going to be right back to the same income level. Mm-hmm. So you're going right. to end up kind of spending money on a very short term problem. So there's a cost. There's always a cost benefit analysis. But with child support, a lot of times I'll put in a new number. Okay, let's. Uh, first of all, they don't know the, what the other person's new yeah. income is. They're guessing. <laughs> guessing. They're basing yeah, it on how they off of what the kids have said and the Millions new car and you know that kind of. So we're <laughs> we're having to totally speculate on what the new income is. But I say, okay, let's just assume it's this number. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's put that in the child support worksheet. It it moves the actual number. Mm-hmm. Not as much as you might think. Yeah. So a lot of times when I'll run these hypotheticals, even these kind of extreme hypotheticals, and I'm like, look, you're going to end up saving, you know, if you reduce your child support, you're going to end up saving 300 bucks, but you're going to end up spending 10 grand to, to get the $300 <laughs> yeah. in savings. This goes to your kids, you know, otherwise it goes to me. And, you know, so I, a lot of times I find myself discouraging a big time when, when child support is modified is if somebody's relocating and we're now dealing with some brand new big expense like visitation related travel expenses or if custody is changing Uh. all of a sudden we've got kids were with dad and now they're going to be with mom or vice versa we got to modify child support or one child's coming off the worksheet and graduating and we had you know four kids in the worksheet now we need to redo it with three those are the times where you really need to modify child support other times it's got to be a pretty drastic change in the financial circumstances or here's what happens in your scenario. You file your lawsuit and you say, I want to modify child support because you're not exercising all the parenting time. They're just going to start exercising all their parenting time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an invitation right. to give up time with your oh, yeah, kids. There yeah, you go. So there's it. always a downside. Yeah. Alimony um, is modified quite often as well. Um, I, I think um, when negotiating a divorce case and you're talking about alimony and division of assets, I, I caution people a lot about the fact that alimony is is modifiable and it's a lot more vulnerable. Like if you get assets, you're going to have those assets. It's a bird in the hand. That's not you're not going to have to give those up. Asset division is a done deal as soon as the divorce decree is signed. Mo- alimony is not. Alimony can be modified or terminated. Um, reasons generally are there. It's generally terminated if the recipient remarries. So. I tell a lot, usually it's women, not always, but I say, you know what, this is going to chill at your dating life because yeah. all of a sudden you want to go remarry and there goes, you know, all this alimony that we fought so hard to get. So let's try to get more of the assets and less alimony if you think you're going to be, and they always say, no, no, I'm not going to be dating. And then six months later, <laughs> you know, they're calling me and how can I, can he come stay with me? Can we move in together? You know, that kind of stuff. So I advise people about that. Um, it can be terminated based on that. It can be modified based on an increase in income. A lot of times the recipient um, of alimony is, is at a zero income level. It's not making any money. 
And so what happens is, and I've started to build this clause into my agreements, but what happens is they, they're making zero. Then as soon as the divorce is over, they're like, well, yeah, that's just great. I'm getting $6,000 a month in alimony, but that's not enough to live mm-hmm. off. I need to go get a job. They go get, do it. They're, what everyone kind of wants them to do, they go get right. a job making $50,000 a year, and all of a sudden the payer of the alimony files a modification and says her income has gone up. I want to reduce my alimony. And you're thinking, well, wait a second. I, we all knew I was going to go get a job, yeah. didn't right. we? Um, so I've started building that into my agreements and saying we are all agreeing on this particularly if we reach an agreement we're agreeing on this alimony number with the expectation that the recipient is going to go get a job up to this threshold so if as so long as her income stays below sixty thousand a year that husband waives his right or, or pay or waives his right to come back and modify based on her increase in income I say all this to say mod- alimony is a very vulnerable thing to be mm-hmm. to be awarded it can it can very easily go away with even the most subtle of changes. In what percent of cases do you think alimony is even awarded anymore? Do you see it declining? I definitely see it declining mm-hmm. for you know the reasons I described earlier. The um, the more women in the workforce, just more um, you know forward thinking um, in on the bench. But um, like less you know, than half, more than I, half. <sighs> It's, I, I, I'm, there's different types. So I mm-hmm. guess I'll, I'll talk to that, talk, speak mm-hmm. on that. There's different types of alimony. Rehabilitative alimony is probably the most common type of alimony we see. And that is your traditional, I, I either didn't work for a period of years or worked to a lesser degree so that you could go travel and, you know, stay out and go to networking events and really um, advance your career. So that's rehabilitative. And the idea is we're going to pay this to you until you can get back out in the workforce. That's just getting awarded less often because there's less, there's just a lot more working women out there. Um, lump sum alimony is when, um, is when a lot of times courts don't want to award alimony necessarily if there are assets mm-hmm. that we could say, you know what, I'm going to give her these assets instead of alimony. They don't like people to be tethered together financially. Um, number one. Number two, judges also know if I award alimony, I'm inviting a modification potentially. I'm inviting more litigation. Whereas if I just give her more of the assets now and no alimony, they're done. They're not coming back to me. So I, I, that's one less case I have to deal with. So um, that's lump sum alimony. I would say, um, you know, I can't really put a percentage on it. I would, you know, maybe 30 to 40 percent of cases, mm-hmm. but it's definitely less common. Are you curious why annuities keep coming up as a potential investment option? People are often told that annuities can effectively mitigate investment risks and help secure their financial future. However, annuities often benefit the salesperson and might not be the best choice for you as a consumer. To learn more about the various types of annuities, the negatives of owning them, and better investment alternatives, we have a free ebook on our website just for you. To download our ebook, Buyer Beware, Why Do They Keep Trying to Sell You That Annuity? Simply click the link in the episode notes or visit wiserinvestor.com slash guides. Now let's get back to the episode. I feel like that we have encountered more bad divorce attorneys than we have found good ones. Um, We've talked about this in prior podcasts, but we had a client who... Um, unfortunately for us, we, we end up a couple of divorces, but they're both clients here, but they don't want to leave here. So we, we have to split the <laughs> parties mm-hmm. down the hall. Got it. You're not a firewall. <laughs> we yeah, have a firewall, firewall exactly. between the two of you. But, um, uh, you know, I was in a case several years ago where a uh, new client says, Hey, will you take on my ex-wife? And we're like, yeah, sure. We have to do that. And I'm meeting with her and, you know, he's got, uh, equity in this business with partners. It's a, Fifty million dollar company, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm so I'm expecting that she's going to have some type of not equity, but but some type of payout from that. Right. And we just need to restructure some things, get her back on track. And I, so she has a list of assets, which is really not much. And I said, so um, how was the equity in the company divided? And she says, oh, no, I didn't get any of that. And I said, um, well, why not? And she said, well, my my attorney said that it was just it's easy to manip- manipulate those numbers and. For what I'd have to pay him, it wasn't worth it. Fifty million. Oh no! Yeah. Oh <laughs> I no! Mean, evaluation so, could yes. not be done. That yeah. is really surprising. And, and I was like, wow. And I, you know, it's one of those cases where 
you can't say anything really because you can't right. change anything at that right. point. No, it's not going to help. So it's you so. just kind of keep it to yourself. But I, I was like, wow, like that's a really bad, that's a really bad attorney. Right. And then we've, we've encountered others that we see the end product and we're like, somebody here, somebody here really screwed this up and didn't see, didn't see the big picture. Right. But I have a thing and, and I didn't bring you all the way across the square in Marietta to offend you, but I have a thing that attorneys are really bad at, at math. That's true. We're not financial people. That's true. But just Except like, billing. I confess. Except I billing. Confess. <laughs> we got, That's the one we, time. We got the billing down pat, right? But but I, I, sometimes I sit here and I look at look at these numbers and I'm like, why is no one else seeing this? Yeah. You know? No, that's very true. I mean, uh, honestly, that's why generally if it's a larger asset case, we're going to hire financial experts to assist us. We don't know. There's a lot of accounting issues. Um, that underlie divorce agreements that right. we can't advise um, capital gains and the restructuring of businesses and whatnot. So, I mean, generally, if it's a high asset divorce case, we're going to hire a financial advisor to to assist us or an appraiser for a, a business. The downside is it's just folks don't want to spend that much money. Uh, often they, you know, it's you're you're doing right. a balance. They're already having to pay us a lot of money. Um, so it, you have to, to weigh the, the value of the estate. I mean, if I knew that there were any time there's a business, I'm going to get it appraised. Yeah. Um, or I, I'm going to strongly advise my client in writing if they decline to, to, to pay for that, right. um, that that's, that's but not even in their that best interest. Yeah. Subjective sometimes. Cause I, I look at what industry says a business is worth and then what, and these business appraisers say, and you look at it and like, do you know anything about business? Mm -hmm. I've never, I've never seen one that I agreed with. Really? No. Yeah. And well, I don't I see mean, a lot. I don't see what you see. Obviously. I mean, I've, I've you, maybe seen 10, 10 in my, my entire career, but whenever they came there across is subjective determination, and I'm just like, uh, you know, th there's one case we worked on together. I came mm -hmm. up to your office and I was like, this isn't right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and, and a lot of times we have what we call the battle of the appraisers. Right. Each side <laughs> hires one yeah, and, and the person yeah. that, you know, the appraiser that represents the, um, the business owner, you know, appraiser miraculously is appraised really low. And then the right. person that's appraised the party that's getting bought out, you know, has a, has a really high number. And so we have to figure out, you know, how to, how to meet in the middle or go and, to and, trial and, and so see who's the more credible expert. Uh, yeah, I get, yeah, that's true. I, I guess in a trial case, but that's expensive too. That's very expensive. I, I just go back to, there's just so many, so many things you can hide in a biz, business P and L. Oh, and when you stare yeah. them at them all day long, you go, okay, well, that's where they're hiding that. And that's where the, you, you kind of see it, right? That doesn't make sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How could that be? <laughs> well, and right. actually the statute, uh, the, the statute on child support addresses that small, um, small business owners and people that are not small business owners, but people that receive self-employment income, um, can obviously manipulate what their mm -hmm. gross income is. Right. You know, it's harder to manipulate gross receipts, but gross income or net is, income. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. You manipulate or the net gross the, and the, net, the, net of mm -hmm. taxes, but the, the gross you can manipulate too, but only for a short time. At mm -hmm. some point you do have to run it through the books. Correct. Unless you know. you're just laundering cash somewhere <laughs> right. else. Well, that's a whole um, different thing. Right. Yes. But that's a different <laughs> podcast. That's podcast number 220. How um, not to laundry money. How not yes. To launder money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I mean, so judges have been directed by, by the General Assembly, that if there is self-employment income, they are to closely inspect the books, not mm -hmm. just take what they say on their tax returns as, as the gospel truth on, on income, and inspect what's being spent on different areas, and then add that back to income. And the statute actually ah. says on child support mm -hmm. that the number for income on child support is often different in a self-employment income scenario than what that person reports to the IRS. Not to say they're doing anything wrong. There right. can be some liberal you know, rules on write-offs with the IRS, yeah. but it's still financial resources available to support the family too. Mm -hmm. sure. So I'm glad our General Assembly has recognized that and directed judges to look further into it um, so that so that all the financial resources available to the family are being considered when determining child support. How often are you guys working with people like Missy, who um, has the certification? Um, I always forget the de CDFA. designation. CDFA. CDFA, thank you. <laughs> Quite, soup. Quite right. often, I would say. Uh, I would say the biggest scenario is there's there's... I've had a lot of, I, I would call them gray hair divorces, yeah. old, older folks that are getting divorced after 40 years of marriage. That was my parents. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah. It surprises. And I guess they just kind of wait until everybody's out the door <laughs> yeah. and college has been paid for right. and there's really, you know, 
there a lot of a lot of them are right when when the the folks are retiring. So we're really mm-hmm. not even having an alimony discussion anymore because nobody's working, and we're really just right. dividing up assets. But a lot of those scenarios, the, uh, the usually the woman um, is receiving a lot of money and has never really managed money, yeah. and um, and so a lot of times we're having to put her in touch with a financial planner. Um, to just figure out what to do. And, and they're usually very concerned about making sure everything lasts until the end of uh, the end of their lives. So, um, I would say a a lot of times that's, that's the scenario where where I would bring you guys in. Yeah. Or even beforehand, we have several cases now pending where we're trying to work work with them before they've even filed or worked with the attorney. Cause I feel like in a lot of cases, if we can get them to an asset division before they even like go down deep with mm-hmm. each of their attorneys, it saves a lot of cost. Yeah. Because there's not, we can have the discussion, you know, you're going to spend so much more than $10,000, you know, going back and forth about that stupid savings account. Just, you know, let it go. And I will say, you guys have a lot more freedom than we do. You're mm-hmm. talking sort of a like a, a collaborative divorce type of concept, mm-hmm. um, which if you've got the right people, they've got to have the right mindset mm-hmm. um, and both be ready to discuss the X's and O's of the divorce. A lot of times emotions get in the way of that mm-hmm. and paranoia or anger or whatever. Um, but if everybody's got the right mindset and wants to do this amicably, that, that you have, um, you're in a, a good position to help them along. I can't meet with two different people Mm -hmm. that I'm legally prohibited from representing two parties. I have to pick one, Mm -hmm. so to speak, and just say, you know, I'm your lawyer. I can only advise you. I cannot give you legal advice. Um, So because you guys aren't bound by those same ethical requirements, you're able to sit down with both parties and say and and have those kind of frank and almost mediate a little Mm -hmm. bit as as financial advisors. We're kind of therapists. Yeah, I know. I am too. Uh, I wear wear different hats. The way I always try to approach it as like, you just want the best for the family unit. Mm -hmm. You know, the more adversarial you are with one another, the less your kids get one day and the less, um, or the lesser your lifestyle is because you're just paying to fight one another and it's not doing anybody good. So Mm -hmm. Figure out what you want, what's really meaningful. Come up with a couple line items that you're willing to give on Mm -hmm. because you know that happens in any negotiation. So have some things that you know he wants or she wants and hold those back because you got to be willing to give some too because it's never as easy as a 50-50 split. It's always a give and take. There's always concessions that have to be made if you want to reach some sort of consensus that everyone can live with. And it may be something stupid, like, you know, the painting you bought in Italy on your honeymoon, okay? Or the dog. Oh, people, oh. (laughs) No, usually it's I felt a jury demand over a dog once. Really? I hate to say, because they couldn't agree. They just could not agree. And I was worried that the court would just sell it. Oh, <laughs> the judge, would, the judge would have been sell so mad that we were trying a case over a dog, but a jury would. And D- George is the only state um, in the U.S. where you can get it. You can demand a jury trial in a divorce case. So I thought, well, I know this judge. They're going to just order the dog sold as punishment yeah. for the parties for not being able so to like right. reach an agreement on this issue. So I right. demanded a jury trial, and the other side said, "Fine, fine, you can keep the dog." <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Oh my God! That's they couldn't crazy. even People work out custody know. over nope. the dog. They worked out everything. All other issues, they couldn't agree on <laughs> division of the dog. No, I thought they was keeping them together. I guess for a while. No, mm-hmm. now they wanted to win. I, <laughs> I don't know this person directly, but I have a friend of a friend that got arrested for. She, I guess she lost the dog. And so she just went over to the house, broke in and took the dog. Oh, no. And got yeah. arrested and for got breaking got, in. Yes, yeah, got arrested wow. for breaking in. Again, like I said, <laughs> divorce. Good people at their worst. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Good people at their worst. <laughs> so, Leslie, if 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 you're we're a person um, that's going to have to go through this process, how would you choose an attorney? Because um, I feel like most people go to Google these days and mm-hmm. maybe they look at ratings or whatever. But that's a pl- that's certainly something that I, I wouldn't start there. I would start by finding a friend or a neighbor or a colleague that has gone through it themselves and mm. that um, can give you advice on exactly what they experienced with this particular lawyer. So, did they return your phone calls? Did they keep you informed about what was going on in your case? Were they if you went to court? Did they seem prepared? Did they you know tell you what to expect? Um, 
so I would, I, that if you're getting a referral from someone who has gone through it already, you're getting some pretty realistic feedback on mm-hmm. what to expect with a particular lawyer. So I would really put feelers out with, even if you don't know somebody that's gone through a divorce, everybody knows somebody. Mm-hmm. So ask your friends to ask their friends, you 50%, know, get, supposedly. So. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, you know, you're going to be able to find a handful of people that went through it. And so get, ask those folks, who did you use? That's where I would start. Um, even if you ask a fellow lawyer, honestly, they didn't usually use that that divorce attorney, so they don't mm-hmm. necessarily know. I would say somebody that's gone through it is going to know exactly what they experienced with that particular lawyer. So that's where I would start. I think that hopefully you can get five or six names from that, and then you can always go online and look at profiles and look at reviews and see um, who who kind of you know gives you the warm feels and and schedule two or three consultations. Most most lawyers charge for for consultations just because. We would be doing free consultations all the time if we if we allowed it. So you're gonna there's gonna be a little bit of an investment there, but finding the right lawyer that you jive with and that you feel comfortable with is really important. Okay, question. So if someone just schedules a consultation and pays you for that, mm-hmm. that's not the same as retaining Correct. you and staking their claim in you, right? Correct. I will say once they consult with me, mm-hmm. the, if the other spouse tried to hire me, I would be con- conflicted out. So, okay. Um, there it are those be. folks out there that, Ooh, that that's lawyer a strategy, shop. Missy. Yeah, I, know. I know. The lawyer shopping Just does happen. Like consult Just, with everybody. Yeah. Consult with everybody. Every that you think. yeah, all yeah. four hundred <laughs> lawyers in the <laughs> metro Atlanta area. Well, that's that's, that's kind of my personnel. well, that's kind of my next question is I would think that if you're divorcing in a county, you want an attorney that was well versed in that county, but you don't you know who works in the county, who mm-hmm. knows the judges, right? But that's a, the, that's a helpful at piece the same of time, it. if someone comes up from Atlanta to Cobb County. Mm-hmm. That's you know, I would it, say most most lawyers in Cobb we practice in all the Metro Atlanta counties. So it really doesn't matter. Not not mm-hmm. really in Metro Atlanta. Okay. I mean if I'm hired What for, if you're in the sticks? If the sticks, <laughs> I mean I've had a I've had a Houston yeah. County case where mm-hmm. I drove down and stayed in a hotel the one time I traveled for work. Right. It wasn't, you know, not or traveled overnight. But you were, know I've were had you, some were you the outsider? Uh, I, where I'm the, the fish out of water a little bit. The city girl, the, the big city yeah. lawyer coming in, but I will, I will be honest. I, I, I'm not as familiar with the judges there, so I can't, um, necessarily say, well, judge so-and-so does this or that. A lot of times we have resources and networks we can reach out to lawyers in that area where we can say, Hey, give me some feedback on this judge. Um, but I will say every time I've gone to the more remote counties that I'm not familiar with, I've had really great experiences. So, okay. um, so maybe it's not a disadvantage then. I, I, I almost think they're nicer to the people coming <laughs> They're so nice in Georgia. I know. It's just that Southern hospitality. So Exactly. That's funny. Okay. So talking about retainers, Leslie, what about in the situation where one spouse is not financially savvy and has no view into the finances, Mm -hmm. but needs to hire a lawyer? Okay. Okay, So that, and that does happen pretty frequently. Um, So first I, I, that the lawyer that's hired in that scenario needs to file a motion for temporary attorney's fees immediately because ah. that is the the quickest way to put yourself at a disadvantage in a divorce case is if you don't have the resources to pay a lawyer. Um, your lawyer is going to stop, you know, I, you're there. We're going to focus on the cases where we're getting paid. We're not going to, we still have to make yeah. payroll too. We're still businesses. So, um, and so you don't want to have to worry about how am I going to pay for re- legal representation? You don't want an uneven playing field. Mm-hmm. Judges will award attorney's fees, temporary attorney's fees. They really will. They want both parties to have quality legal representation. It makes their job easier. Mm-hmm. They want the, the local lawyers to get paid. You know, they don't want to, um, to, to have a local member of the bar stiffed because, or do yeah. legal work that's not, that they're not getting paid for. So it's usually a pretty easy motion to prevail on you, but you got to file it right away. You got to email the judge's staff or get on, get on the court's calendar and do it right away. So you don't let that issue get out ahead of you. If the person right then and there does not have the money, mm-hmm. I mean, at the very initial meeting, usually I'll say, have you tried to open a credit card? Have yeah. you tried to call a family member? We at least get me to that first hearing where okay. I can say, judge, not only do I need fees from the other side, but she also had to 
put money on this credit card. I need you to order him to pay off this credit card. Okay, good. So, but that at least gets me going so that I'm not in the hole right away. Um, so usually we'll start there. Now, if it's a, a really big estate, I know the money is there. I know I'm going to get paid. I might consider taking it without an initial retainer. That's a very, very rare instance. Yeah, though. that's going down. On yeah, and and frankly, because clients can change their minds, yeah. they the parties could reconcile. You know, there's all these <laughs> things that could that yeah. crazier things happen. So we like to at least pay, get paid. But I, usually a, a good lawyer is going to to get that immediate hearing to okay. get attorney's fees on the front end so that it's a level playing field and every everybody feels like they don't have to settle their case just because they don't have enough money to pay their lawyer. That's a really good point. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, yeah I, I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I see it as kind of a, uh, it's a game in some sense. It's a negotiation. Oh, yeah. And, I, and then that's, that's something that I've, the advice that I've given to clients is they've gone through this process is this isn't a business transaction. Mm -hmm. And once you are done with this, you can mourn the loss mm. at that time. It's true. But you've got to take all the emotion and put it aside and you've got to just go make a, you got to conduct business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plow through. And then I think that's the hardest thing for people to do because then fluffy gets involved and yeah. <laughs> the dog, oh, the dog, right. Yes, and, and all the, all the other things that, we decided this is the end. You're just going to make a business transaction. You can be kind of cold about it. And yeah, I think, and I think that's can, what happens yeah. in, in the cases that I've seen that have, that were not favorable to our client. Again, they're usually coming here after the fact, but yeah. I would say that, Oh, well he was crying at the table that he's never going to see the kids. And so I gave him this or, mm -hmm. you know, or a situation where, you know, well, I just didn't want to, hurt his business and you know, I know. It, it there's just... a lot of emotion. I have a case right now where um, we're dealing with lifetime alimony because um, I've, I've done this in a lot of my cases, my gray hair divorces that I've had for whatever reason, a lot of recently is I try to um, equalize their social security payments because that's, <laughs> right. a, that's an asset. It's Absolutely. not the social security administration is not going to divide no. it for you. But right. what I argue is this is a 40 year marriage and why should he get twice as much as her every month when they, she, yeah. she didn't work this whole time. So she wasn't paying into social security. She can get half of his, yeah. but, but wh that's why, why should he get yeah. 4,000 a month and she get two when that, right. you know, they basically live their whole life together. So I, argue for a, a an equalizer and it has to be called lifetime alimony because the social security administration isn't going to direct a payment his payment to her so i just i just um put in my agreements that he's going to transfer whatever amount is necessary usually it's about a thousand dollars to equalize their two retirement or social security payments mm -hmm. as a lifetime alimony award but in addition to that I say he's got to secure it with life insurance because if he dies tomorrow, she's not getting that lifetime alimony anymore. So um, I had a case Which recently. That can get expensive too. Can't, it, particularly mm -hmm. at that age, Greater. at that yeah. age bracket. And it doesn't have to be much, but you know, $100,000 policy or whatnot. But I had a case recently where my, the, the wife was, was guilt tripped that, you know, if you, if you're the beneficiary of this life insurance, you're stealing money from your children, you know, you're, oh, and Lord. so she came to me and really was very adamant, you know, I don't want to be the beneficiary of his life insurance. I'm, you know, and she, it's everybody in the family, I guess, was buzzing about this. And I said, you just, that's an emotional reaction. You have to protect, this is a big asset that you need. You mm -hmm. need to get these monthly payments every month. And if he dies, you're not going to get them and you're going to be in in a world of trouble. So you're just going to have to move on from these emotional, you know, feelings about mm -hmm. that type of thing, but children and family members and the community and gossip and all of those things kind of cause these emotional reactions. I think that's true. I think are, when you have adult children, it really oh, changes things because yeah, you can ear, actually have, ear. you can actually have a conversation mm -hmm. about things and yeah. people get fired up very emotionally. They about do. That. And, and, and I think, harder. Frankly, people feel freer to talk bad about the other parent with their adult kids. <laughs> I guess, yeah. You know, they're not dealing with like fragile children anymore. <laughs> so like they the, let it out. Yeah. Like yeah. the mud starts flying at that point and then people are taking sides. I shouldn't laugh. It's not it's not a funny thing, but I do see that. Like adult children get kind of take take sides and get oh, yeah. pulled into it. Sadly, that shouldn't happen, um, regardless of whether they're adults or minors. So what do you do to disconnect from all this? Because I see your world as being very chaotic. People have to talk right away, right now. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you do? Uh, well, when I first started practicing, I, I took all my cases home with me. I, I really mm -hmm. empathized with my clients or sympathized with them. And, um, I, I did have a, a tough time separating myself from their situations. I finally had to realize when people are going through a divorce, 
it is just their their valley in life. You know, some people get cancer, some people mm-hmm. get hit by a bus, some mm-hmm. people go through a nasty divorce. It's not it, everyone kind of has those valleys in life that we have to to kind of slog through and this is theirs. I'm helping them through theirs, but they're going to be they're going to find a better place. We're going to get through this. So uh, if I when I started looking at it that way, I was able to sort of separate myself a little bit and have a have a, a more direct attitude to to my cases. I'm still very empathetic to my clients. I know what they're going through is one of the more difficult things they they will ever probably go through in their life. But that's um, but it's something we all you know some some level of of tragedy is something we're all going to experience most likely. So um, you know I, that that sort of helped me um, reconcile it in my head so I didn't lose sleep every night over every single case. Yeah. Interesting, because that's the similar approach that I take with the divorce clients, Mm -hmm. because I tell them, you know, it's okay to feel hurt and down and go through all those emotions, but realize this is your, like, one time in life, you get to press the reset Mm -hmm. button, now it's all about you, you know, remake your life, Mm -hmm. remake yourself, and you're in charge of your own destiny now, Mm -hmm. so I think by reframing it like that for them, we can help them, like, get through that grief process Mm -hmm. and look at the positive path that they have in front of them, should they choose to take it, so you can dwell in your misery and all the bad things about the process because, yeah, we know it's miserable mm-hmm. and no one wants to go through a divorce. But by having a good divorce attorney and a good planner on your side, like, oh, you can make the most of it mm-hmm. and you're going to be so much happier on the back end once you're through that battle. And, you know, in some of these cases, like decades of a bad marriage. Mm-hmm. So it's all your own now and just spin it. So what do you think, um, what do you think your best advice is to someone who is about to go through this process for both of you? I would say what I said earlier, start with, um, getting referrals for a good lawyer, schedule some consults with some good folks and find somebody that you feel very comfortable with. Make sure establish on the front end, you know, how, how, how informed am I going to be in this process? How much are you going to communicate with me? Um, have questions going in that that person can answer. Um, I would, if you're able, I would try to keep an open line of communication with your spouse. That's not always possible. Um, but the more that you and your spouse can get along, work things mm-hmm. out, and it, even if you can't settle every issue, narrow the issues, less, the less you're involving the lawyers, you can always, the, the more money you're going to save. Um, and the more likely you're, you're going to come out of uh, the, the end of the process, being able to get along and go to the graduations and the weddings down the road that, that everyone knows you're going to have to be at together. So if you can keep some of that goodwill with one another, that's going to be huge. So I would, if it's possible, obviously if there's some, you know, domestic violence involved or the emotions are just too high or it's going to impact your ability to grieve the process, you know, or your mental health to have a discussion with the other person, you know, there's, there are those situations. But if you can keep an open line of communication with the other party and just talk through some of the issues, you don't have to reach an agreement. You can mm-hmm. still get feedback from your lawyer and get guidance from your lawyer. But those are the cases where I, I see a lot of success is they come in, they kind of get some guidance from me. Okay, what what do you think a reasonable outcome would be? And I tell them, well, if I sit down with my spouse, what do we need to talk about? We need to kind of come up with these answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. Are we going to sell the house or is somebody going to keep it? And if so, you know, what's the, what's the buyout number going to be? And then you got to figure out, you know, are you guys going to be able to agree on custody? If if answer these five questions, you know, who's going to, where's the child going to go to school? What's the school district going to be? But I can kind of give them a framework where you got, if you guys sit on the kitchen table and kind of reach some sort of consensus on some of these, you've eliminated half the work for the lawyers. But you also both have to convey the same messages to your lawyers. You know, your spouse has to be willing to tell their lawyer <laughs> the, <truth>. the same <laughs> thing. Like right. the, 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 we both want this to be collaborative. But surprisingly, most people want that. Most people inherently d- want to be mm-hmm. amicable in their divorce. And don't. most people don't want to spend a lot of money on a lawyer. I mean, so I tell people that they're always like, well, they're, you know, they're going to want to fight. They're going to want to, um, you know, make this miserable for me. And I'm like, you'd be surprised. I very rarely have a client sit in my office and say, I want to make this miserable for the other side. Mm. That rarely happens. Um, and I very rarely have a client in my office that says, I can't wait to pay you a whole lot of money. That just doesn't happen. <laughs> so most people intuitively want to keep this amicable and, and affordable and move on with their lives. And so you just have to 
kind of keep your emotions in check, like you said, and, and treat it like a business transaction. The more you can do that, the better. I would say from the financial side is just gathering good data up front. So you have the DERFA, the Divorce Related Financial Affidavit. That's collecting all the income expenses, assets, and liabilities from each side. And I feel like that's the hardest for a lot of stay-at-home spouses to ever figure out how to put together. Mm -hmm. So if they can just start getting like their maybe annual credit card statements, like that's like the biggest ticket into the window of like where your monthly money goes. Just get that in the checkbook ledger and you should be able to categorize your monthly expenses. So that's a big you know, step into that world. And then in terms of assets and liabilities, you know, find last year's tax return, start getting all the joint and individual account statements and just throw it all on a thumb drive. You know, you don't have to be sneaky or underhanded. It's all marital things. So don't feel like you're going behind your spouse's back doing this. You are entitled to this information. It's all going to come out during the divorce process. So go ahead and start gathering those records. Get it all in one place. I just recommend a thumb drive. That way, if you go see your attorney or your CDFA, you know you can take it portable with you. You're not going to worry about passwords and all that stuff. So just start getting information. And that's a good point. I I will say, I mean, a lot of times I say to people, well, I think I'm on this account. I'm not sure. I say, go to the bank. Mm -hmm. Like, as soon as you leave my office, go to Truist Bank or or Wells Fargo or wherever the bank is and say, do I have any accounts in my name? Here's my social security number. They will tell you. And then even if it's an account that you haven't been, you know, intimately involved in, you can still get the statements. They'll Mm -hmm. they'll give them to you there. Um, And so that's a, a good way to to bypass a lot of the, uh, of the difficulty and get it from the other getting it from the other side, but also figuring out your budget because you're right the the monthly expenses and the budget is what sort of creates starts to build the framework for an alimony discussion what that need is. Uh, Leslie, if they want to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Well, they can call my office. My number is 770-405-0164. I'm on the internet. Leslie O'Neill. Um, last name is spelled O apostrophe N E A L. I'm here um, in Marietta, right off the Marietta Square, about a mile off the Marietta Square at Odell O'Neill, Hungerford, and Blanchard. We've been around for over 10 years. Um, and like I said, we litigate in most of the metropol- or metro Atlanta counties, so we're very familiar with, with all of these jurisdictions and, you know, happy to assist. Uh, we have some other podcast episodes. Episode 160, this is 209, by the way. Um, been doing this a while. <laughs> episode 160, How Finances Affect Divorce. Episode 153, How to Recover Financially After Divorce. And then on our YouTube channel, uh, A Wiser Retirement, we have Will I Have Access to Money When I File for Divorce? We kind of answered that a little bit today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what is a certified divorce financial analyst? I'll have to listen to that one. Did you do that one? I guess you did. I guess I did. I know <laughs> I didn't do that one. <laughs> um, those are, that's on the YouTube channel, all linked on our uh, show notes anywhere you're listening to this podcast. Also, we'll link uh, to Leslie O'Neill's contact information as well. Uh, Thanks for listening today uh, to this episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth Management, you can find us online at wiserinvestor.com. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of our financial advisors, you can do so um, by hitting the schedule link online. Thanks for listening. And uh, Leslie, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced by Edward Resendez. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment 
advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation, and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk, and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.